Benaiah Oprah and Mrs. All had too. The debate advanced by Mildred and Richard Loving in 1967 U.S. Supreme Court case Loving versus Virginia defied the principle that mixed race couples should not marry. This was previously thought not only acceptable, not only just, but right. The court's decision was a victory for the Lovings, overturning remaining anti-miscegenation laws in the United States and drastically increasing not only the acceptance, but regularity of intermarriage in the United States. And with that, I present to you all our two. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. These words frequently spoken rarely ring true within the walls of our America. I, Mildred Loving, or Jeter is legally known within the state of Virginia, would know better than most the sad and suppressed cries of oppression that may ring through one's own home. Born a Negro woman, well, classified a Negro woman, truly I identify myself as a Native American. Yes, Native American my wife is, well, that and Negro, of course. The point is, she's colored and I, Richard Loving, am a white man. Now, growing up in Caroline County, a community in Virginia, a state in which an anti-black mindset is the norm, there was actually a relatively low amount of racial tension or friction. I mean, people had been mixing all the time. See, back in 1924, a man named Dr. Walter A. Plecker took it upon himself to write and propose to the state of Virginia itself, a health bulletin that states, the intermarriage of the white race with mixed stock must be made impossible. The public must be led to look with scorn and contempt upon any man who will degrade himself and do harm to society by such abhorred deeds. In other words, humanity was disgusted by the thought of any white who would look upon a Negro with intent to either mix or marry him. Now, I of course said yes. I'd just become pregnant with this child and we'd been seeing each other for years. All our family called it love at first sight. And before the whole debacle with the police, there was surely nothing odd about the whole situation. Of course, there was the slight hiccup that it can't be here, Mildred. And yes, I know, our friends are here, our families are here, our homes are here. Richard, our hearts are here. Many things are here in Virginia, Mildred, that is true, but don't be mistaken, my heart is with you. And so, Richard and Mildred took each other and their hearts up to D.C., where it was legal to wed, returning to Virginia as Mr. and Mrs. Loving, or so they thought until about one month later, in the wee hours of 2 a.m., their bedroom was bombarded by police. We have a warrant of arrest for one Richard Loving and one Mildred Jeter. Is it true that you, ma'am, and you, sir, exited the state of Virginia with intentions of returning wed? Thought so. This violates the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, written by one Dr. Walter A. Plecker. The repercussions of this infraction are anywhere from one to five years in state prison. I tried to show the sheriff it was okay. I pointed to the marriage license hanging above our bed frame to which he replied it was worth no more than the dirt on our shoes. Our marriage was illegal. Our mere love was illegal. Now if loving my Negro wife is not right, then lock me up. They gave us a few moments to gather our things before dragging Richard and me, five months pregnant, to Bowling Green County Jail. To Bowling Green County Jail. Richard was put up for bail and admitted the next day. I, on the other hand, was held for several more days on the second floor, a cell in which the plumbing was not even serviceable. That was the beginning of a revolution, a debate, a dispute, a fight for my rights, which should be inalienable. In that cell, I realized these truths are not self-evident. Fast forward, it's January, 1959. Mildred and I are sitting before a grand jury. Our first son has just been born. Now, at the time, Virginia was just one of nearly 20 states in which interracial marriage was outlawed. The commotion was more than we ever could have imagined, never mind intended. I loved her, but the judge, of course, did not understand this plain and simple fact of phenology. The accused ought to leave this state for a period of 25 years, and at no other time may you return together. No, never together in this state for at least 25 years. Now, this was a plea deal, a courtesy from the judge. So Richard and I packed our bags and headed up north to D.C. Two hours, but time is besides the point. Virginia was our home. Years exiled to D.C., but life did go on as we had and raised our three children, though I wanted to go home. My family was there, my husband's family was there, and I hated to live in the city. So when we all started hearing rumblings of this civil rights movement everywhere we went, it sparked something in me. In 1963, I wrote a letter to U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. Dear sir, I'm writing to you concerning a problem we have. Five years ago, my husband and I were married here in the district. We then returned to Virginia to live. See, at the time, we did not know there was a law in Virginia against mixed marriage. Therefore, we were jailed and tried in the little town of Bowling Green. Now, it took him a while to respond, but after a few months of patiently waiting, we received a letter in the mail. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Loving, 
I referred you to the American Civil Liberties Union, to which a young volunteer lawyer, Bernard Cohen, has accepted. In other words, you've got a case. And it was that simple letter that got us into a not so simple case. Now I, Bernard Cohen, was 29 years old and frankly unexperienced and an expert in arguing cases of such substantiality. I needed help. That is where my partner, Philip Hirschkopf, comes in. Hirschkopf and I advanced the argument that these statutes are slavery statutes. They were meant to keep the Negro race under the badges and bonds of slavery. Together, we reopened the case, this time all the way to the Supreme Court, based on the allegation that these slavery statutes contradicted the 14th Amendment. See, Richard, Cohen, Hirschkopf, and I all agree that marrying anyone you want to is a right no man should have anything to do with. It's a God-given right, I say. However, much of the people, the media, the white people, did not come to such comparable conclusions. Protests broke out in the streets sometimes, protests against love, against our love. It hurts to watch people who I see as equals as they march in the streets fighting for inequality. They hold up the American flag next to signs that read, race mixing is communism and stop the race mixing march of the antichrist. The American flag, am I not an American? Entering on the court date was nerve wracking to say the least. Hirschkopf and I were arguing against Virginia's Assistant Attorney General, General Robert D. McKinley III, a mouthful, I know, and a case of such volume before Chief Justice Earl Warren in the Supreme Court, it was the case to make or break my thus far short career as an attorney. Number 395, Richard Perry Loving, Appellants versus Virginia, the defense. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, in dealing with the unconstitutionality that applies to this case, I have two main points. Considering that equal protection and due process are both values this country holds near and dear, anti-miscegenation laws shall favorably be struck down. Now, in dealing with the equal protection argument, we feel that on its face, on its face, these laws are meant to hold the Negro class to a lower position. These are not health and welfare laws. These are slavery laws, pure and simple. And while there is no doubt in our mind that these laws are unconstitutional and have run afoul of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, we urge with equal strength that these laws also run afoul of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Your Honor, we believe that on the basis of integration, the Constitution deprives the Negro race, no, colored people, and as it applies to this case, the Negro race, of their basic rights stated in the Declaration, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, namely the right to marry. It was on that day that I remember my eyes being opened to a whole nother side of segregation. Slowly, McKillway's argument, possibly my argument just a few months ago, became less and less respectable. Your Honor, these statutes aren't slavery statutes. No, these laws are put up for the same reason we pass laws against incestuous marriage, pedophilic marriage, to keep pure blood in America. I see, and by doing so, you are degrading the color. People. No, simply keeping them pure, Your Honor. Then why are there not laws prohibiting yellow from mixing with melee or red with Negro? Mr. McKillwain, with all due respect, the only race you are trying to keep pure is your own. They went on like this, debating about equal protection and due process, rights, liberty, and justice for many, many days until finally it was. June 12th, 1967, I, Chief Justice Earl Warren, hereby declare this meeting begun. I will now read the verdict. The U.S. Supreme Court's unanimous decision in 1967, Loving v. Virginia, has hereby overturned remaining anti-miscegenation laws in the United States, including Virginia, therefore dropping all charges against one Richard Loving and one Mildred Jeter. I remember Mildred falling to her knees. She was absolutely and completely overcome. Our lives were to be forever changed. Not only ours, but everyone's lives were to be forever changed. I remember thinking of our three children, our three children growing up legal, growing up in a world where color was an important in place of marriage, growing up in a world where you could love who you loved. Briefly and fleetingly, I pictured a world where color wouldn't be important at all. For all our hearts are red, aren't they?